We're live? Watch live right here. Ha! How you doing, folks? It says we're live. Would you look at that? That's what it says. Oh, it even caught me singing. Oh, my goodness, that could be bad. <laughs> if we ever catch Randy singing, things are going down the tubes in a hurry. Like a really, really big hurry. Well, what's the deal going on on Facebook here? You got anything on Facebook, my friend? Let me check real quick. How are we doing on uh, Instagram? Did we turn that on? We are live on Instagram. We're live on Instagram, all right. I don't know what the deal is with Facebook. They're always behind the times. We're here, let's see, we got uh, Elk Talk Live is on live stream. Facebook it's stream. on Instagram. You're, you got it going on Facebook? Yep. I better re-hit my Facebook button there. Anyhow, welcome folks. We are in uh, episode, what is it, 67 I believe. Yeah, 67, something like that. Where's the number over there? Yeah, 67 of Elk Talk Live. That means we've been doing this for a long time. And right away we gotta just say that this idea of Elk Talk Live was all the idea of Botech. And when Botech threw it out there, some of our other partners said, hey, yeah, we like that idea. Can we be a part of it? So because of Botech, which right here, and many of you ask what bow I'm shooting, right? Right there, see that, huh? Bowtie. Uh, oh, also brought to you by Black Gold Ripcord. I took my tight spot quiver off there. But also, loophole. I don't know, camera guy messed up my, my setup here. I'm not sure what he was doing. I like that loophole logo right there. Uh, on X Maps, use promo code Randy and save 20% on all your app products because you all drew a tag, right? You got to get 20% off at Onyx. And you probably drew that tag because you use Go Hunt, who also makes this possible, who's giving you $50 of free credit in their gear shop if you use promo code Randy. And then you got Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls that will give you 15% off all your calls if you use promo code Randy. So there you got it. Using promo code Randy gets you a lot of good things in this world. Uh, it says something went wrong with our video, my friend, on Facebook. Are we done? No, I still got you here. Huh? I still got you. You still got me? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm tired of technical defugalties here. I, I'm not up. I'm done. What's going on? Someone says, right, it says, I can see and I can hear. All right, let's try this. Gotcha. Nope, yep, nope, yep. Gotcha. Oh, Joe, Joe wants to know, when are you announcing me as the winner of the Orion Cooler? Uh, sorry, Joseph, we did announce the winner of the Orion Cooler, and he got a promo code where he gets to pick out whatever Orion Cooler he wanted. So thanks for everyone who provided a... Uh, an answer to that. Those of you who wonder what we're talking about, we did a video where we said, tell us where you consume your video content. Do you mostly consume it on Instagram? Do you do it on Facebook, YouTube, or Amazon? These, the way you guys ans answer those questions drives our content, just like here. On this Elk Talk Live, we can't get to all the questions we get every month, but we've got this huge running spreadsheet. How many how many pages are we on now, Kyler, that we've been keeping track of? We're like, we've got like a 40 page spreadsheet here from questions all of you are asking and we're accumulating and accumulating and that's what drives the content. If we get a bunch of people asking the same question, it's like, you know, we must have a gap in our information. So even if we don't get to your question here, your question is still used by us and you may, you may not think so, but we definitely use it that way. So, any of you disappointed that the screen's not uh, stacked on top of each other this week? We get a regular screen, right? What do, what do you think of our, our decor here? As you can tell, I've got an antelope problem. This is just a very small portion of what my wife calls the herd. Uh, so, anyhow, appreciate all you being here. Uh, 
If you're wondering if you drew a tag, there's some good news coming out in the next, well, I'd say in the next two weeks, you're going to know from Utah, you're going to know from Colorado, and you're going to know from Nevada. By the Friday before Memorial Day, we'll know from probably all three of those states. Colorado sometimes drags their feet a little bit, but remember the deadline for Idaho. It's the only remaining, no, Oregon, May 15th. So if you're into Oregon, May 15th, I think is that deadline. And then we've got Idaho, June 5th. So there's still a chance to get in the limited entry game, but if you didn't draw or you haven't applied, once we get these, all these deadlines past us, we're gonna do a bunch of video, a bunch of discussion about all these states where, like Colorado, you can go over the counter. Colorado has some leftover tags or alternate tags that get turned back in. Montana, we have alternate tags, and then in that process, what happens is May 6th, uh, Monday, when people turn their tags back in with the April draw, whenever that came out, April 20th or something, a lot of people turn their tag back in because they didn't draw their limited entry portion. They said, ah, if I don't draw the limited entry, I don't want my general tag. So Monday morning, it was mayhem. Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks site went down. But here, think about this. I think it's August 6th, 7th, 8th, somewhere in there. That's when Montana then goes to first come, first serve on all the tags that get turned back over the summer. So there's always going to be a chance for somebody to go elk hunting somewhere, someplace. And then you got Idaho, which right now there's still a check yesterday, was it? they still have a lot of non-resident elk tags available. So be thinking about all of that stuff. <clears throat> um, let's see, what do we got for questions? Mm -hmm. You got anything uh, on Instagram, Kyler? So here's how we do this. Kyler takes them off Instagram and he puts them on a spreadsheet and I read them. And then he takes them off live stream, puts them on a spreadsheet and I read them. And then I try to do the ones that are on Facebook, but we're, multi we're monitoring multiple Facebook channels at the same time. So if we don't get to you, it's not that we aren't interested. It's just that we're, things are going busy for us, like really fast. So someone asked, Randy, how do you like the bone broadheads that you used last year? I love them. If you watch the bison episode that we did, that's out on our YouTube channel, 43 yards, 60 pounds draw length, 29 inch, or draw weight, 29 inch draw length, about a 500 grain arrow setup. Hit that bison right here, and that arrow penetrated into this shoulder blade, into the bone, and broke off as he started running. That's a lot of penetration. And I love the fact that if that was an elk, a deer, whatever, I'm getting a complete pass through. So I'm gonna have blood trailing on both sides of the body, body cavity. So really like them. Uh, Randy, what do you think about grizzly tags in Wyoming? I think that it's probably gonna be in court for a lot longer. Um, I sat on the governor's grizzly bear round table for Montana for three years, 90, I think it was in 99, 2000 and 2001, if I remember right, where Five from Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. The 15 of us worked with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to come up with the Greater Yellowstone Conservation Strategy. That's the plan that keeps being litigated. So I'm super familiar with that plan, having spent three years working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do it. Uh, it's, uh, it it's, it's a great plan. It's just, are they gonna let the states have management control? Uh, how do I work less and hunt more? Uh, I get that question a lot. And I don't know, maybe it's worth talking about. Uh, but when I was younger, I didn't hunt this much. I worked way more than I hunted. Uh, it just, what I had to do. Got out of school, had student loans, had a kid, you know, had to buy a, a vehicle. I, I paid for everything myself. My, I wasn't in a situation where my family could afford my college or anything. So it was kind of like start from scratch. If I had any advice about how you can work less and hunt more is stay away from debt. Don't go into debt unless it's the roof over your head. That's the only debt that you should have. 
because debt never sleeps, right? Interest never sleeps. So it doesn't take much of a lifestyle or much of an income, let's put it that way, to allow for a comfortable hunting lifestyle. If your payments aren't always going to a bank, you don't have payments going to a credit card company. So I don't know, that's, that's my quick dissertation on how you can hunt less and work more. Um, do I use a single pin sight? Uh, nope. The folks at Black Gold made me a three pin sight. 20, 30, 40. And yeah, I have a slider here that goes, <laughs> these tapes go way out. I'll never use the, how far they go out. Um, and because at, at my age, my vision is not what it used to be. Um, I just, I keep my shots now to 40 yards plus or minus. I mean, if it like that bison was 43 and it's got a target this big, all right, I'll do that. Anything beyond 40, I'm just, I'm not there. So, uh, and I admire the people who are dead on at whatever ranges, but for me, I want it simple. That's why I have a, a black gold descent three pin sight. First one's 20, 30, 40, works great for hunting. Um, oh, let's see. Randy, you're always talking about using trekking poles. What brand do you recommend? I use Leaky, L-E-K-I. Um, there are a ton out there and lots of options. Which ones work? I've had my Leakies for over a decade. Uh, and they work great. I use the binder clip ones. I don't use the, you know, whatever they're called, twist, whatever. Uh, I use aluminum ones, they work great. Um, and if you start using trekking poles in the mountains, you will never go back. A uh, number of people who go to me and, or go with me and say, I'm not sure about those trekking poles. And I am like, here, just humor me and use them. They're like, I think I'll be using these forever. Where, where you go elk hunting, some of the places just, especially when you have a load on your back, we're always carrying probably 30 pounds as our day pack because of all the extra gear we got to bring for production. Just that over the course of a day, a trekking pole takes so much wear and tear off your legs, your knees, your ankles, even your torso. If you're on uneven ground, side hilling, going downhill, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, uh, Randy, do you believe in the motto of ounces make pounds and minimize weight wherever possible? I used to, but I don't quite anymore. Uh, part of that is I'm 54 and I need some comforts. I need a good night's sleep. So when we did our doll sheep hunt last year, guys were chuckling pretty hard because I had a two-man Hilleberg Nalo 2GT tent, which weighs about an extra pound and a half over some other tents, but it's got a great big vestibule. I was comforted, it rained every day, I'm so comfortable. Everyone's envying my tent. And I'm sleeping way better than anyone else. My stuff isn't getting wet. So, I, I, I can't say I'm a, a every ounce matters guy anymore. I used to really think that did, and, and it does for some people. And the way some people hunt, I understand why it is that way with them. But it, it's just not for me anymore. Um, all right, Alan loves the wall behind us. All right, we like that. That's good feedback. <clears throat> we'll have to do more. Brennan asks, Randy, what are your thoughts on the Leupold VX3i? My thought is buy every one that you can afford. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> They're, if there's a better, if, if you believe that value is the intersection of quality and performance, or uh, uh, price and performance, I don't think you're gonna find a better value than the VX3i, uh, personal opinion. Um, <laughs> Randy, I think you lost your Facebook sponsorship after all that criticism. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, I better quit picking on Facebook. Uh, they'll, they'll cut me out here. Uh, someone says they're watching our show right now. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Um, let's see what else we got out of here. 
Mike from Arizona says, Randy, just like you, I worked way too much when younger, and now at 60, I want to go hunting all the time. Thanks for your instruction. Uh, yeah, I have a motto, and what it is is I say, hunt when you can because you're going to run out of health before you run out of money. And part of that is just my life events of having, we all have, it's not just me. Everybody loses some family, some dear friends way too young. And how many of them said, I'm going to go on that elk hunt next year? Or, yeah, in a couple of years, me and my buddies, we're going to go do this. And they keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And sometimes next year never comes. So uh, my wife is convinced I want to run out of money before I run out of health. And I'm well on the path to doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, I, I'm a strong believer that go when you can, go when your health allows because someday your health will not allow it and you're going to wish you had. Um, well, let's see. What do most first time elk hunters seem to forget? Um, I'll go, I'll think about myself. I'll put myself in that shoe. I was a whitetail hunter. Uh, when I started elk hunting. And I would say it's not that I forgot it, I just didn't know it. I did not know how mobile elk were. I did not know how noisy elk were. Um, I, I, I didn't know how good their nose was. I always thought, oh, whitetail, that's really, I mean, that's the species with the real sharp nose. Elk are right up there with whitetails. Um, and I probably didn't know how much weather they could withstand. I was thinking the first snow, the bulls are going to get pushed down. Or the first little bit of cold weather, they're going to get pushed down. Now public land bulls, they can really deal with a lot of weather and a lot of cold. So I would say those are things that I didn't really understand. I'd say the thing that most hunters, even non-first timers like me, forget. We get excited and we get in a hurry. And we charge in there thinking, oh, I'll get a shot before the wind messes me up. Nope. <laughs> Pretty much screwed it up every time with my, with my situation there. Um, Randy, what sleeping bag do you recommend? It depends on what time of year, what elevation, what conditions. Uh, the sleeping bag I use in November is usually a minus 10 bag and it's a synthetic. The sleeping bag I use in September is usually a 25 bag and it's down. Um, so it, it would just depend. Uh, let's see, Randy, a Metcalf or a Beartooth 80 for your elk hunting pack? Uh, I'd say I, get, I have both and I love them both. When I went on this 10 day sheep hunt in Alaska, I used a Beartooth 80. Unbelievable pack, just so good. So, so well designed for a multi-day, like five, seven, eight day trip. Uh, the Metcalf, a little less, less volume, uh, compresses a little bit more, and it's probably my go-to all around everyday elk hunting pack is the Mystery Ranch Metcalf. Oh, is there a magic number for the elevation when hunting elk in the early season? No, there's not. Uh, because in Colorado, in the early season, you might be hunting up between 11, um, above 11,000 feet. Other places, like the Missouri Breaks or the eastern Montana, you aren't going to find anything over 8,000 feet. So, there really is no elevation. But remember in early season, by early season I'm talking August, they are on a food pattern. They're still looking for food, especially the mature bulls. It'll be a little bit into September before that early season transitions to pre-rut and the bulls start leaving the food sources and heading to where the cows are at. And the bulls and the cows will usually select for different food. So if you see cows feeding, very often, at least in mountain habitats, you're going to see the bulls slightly higher or in some other place selecting for a different food. I can't explain why, but bulls can make a living on a different food than the cows. The cows are lactating, they're trying to still nurse a, a calf, so they need the absolute best food they can find. So don't be surprised if you find, if you're in an early season on a food pattern and you find groups of cows in one place, but the bulls are in a completely different place. Um, 
Let's see. You know, this, I get this question a lot. This one, and I, I'm going to bring it up because of how often I get it. Usually I don't get it publicly. Uh, but Ryan says, hey, Randy, how did you overcome your fear of the dark? I know I could be a better hunter if I could hike in the dark. Ryan, you're not the only one who has that issue. I, that's one of the most common questions I get, which tells me there's a lot of people with that same situation. And I, I try to put myself in those shoes because I grew up in the woods. As a little kid, we'd go play hide and seek in the woods in the pitch dark. So since I was four years old, I've been running around in the dark and I've never really thought about nighttime or darkness as anything really different than daytime. So, but uh, I wish I could tell you how to overcome it. Though I, I am not someone who's able to, you know, say, oh, this is why you have that discomfort and here's how you, you, you deal with discomforts. Um, I don't know, maybe it requires having someone walk in with you and not go in solo until you get a comfort level with it. Uh, maybe it's hunting in a place where, okay, I know there are no grizzly bears here and that's fine. I mean, it, whoa. <laughs> I walk in in the dark or out in the dark in a lot of instances where it is a little sketchy. When you're in grizzly country and you're walking in and out in the dark, every little thing you hear is like, I've been walking out before and I see two little beady eyes there and it's a coyote or something. It's like, oh, what is that? Uh, so there's times where it kind of catches your attention, but I wish I had an answer to it. Um, I would just say push yourself at times. I mean, obviously not to where you get panicked, but you got to get outside of those comforts. And like I said, if it's going with somebody who... Just, you know, you do it enough times and you kind of like, oh, why is I worried about this? But point is, you are not the only person with that question. I get it so often. I mean, a lot. And usually when it pops up, as I tell people, you have to leave the trailhead well before the sun comes up so that you're at your glassing knob when the prime period is. If you leave your truck right at daylight, you're not gonna get to that glassing knob until the elk are already in their beds. And the same in the evening. You gotta stay there till shooting light is over. And that means walking out in the dark. And if you cut that first hour, hour and a half out of your day and that last hour, hour and a half out of your day, you're really cutting out the premium times to be elk hunting at least in rifle season. And even in archery season, I'm walking through in the dark a lot of times, just making location bugles. So I, I wish I had an answer for it. I'm, I'm sorry I don't, but it's, I, 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 the reason I brought it up is I want you to know there's a ton of people out there that have that question and you're the first guy who's had the courage to, to ask it this way, so. Uh, Randy, have you ever run into any problems with mountain lions? I always feel like I'm looking over my shoulder while hunting in the mountains of Colorado. I've not had any problems with them. I've seen one mountain lion while I've been out hunting. I've seen lots of tracks. I know they're around, but I really, I don't worry about it. Um, I, 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 I don't know what to, again, it's one of those, I just, when I think about the risks of what I'm exposing myself to when I'm out in the woods, worrying about a mountain lion attack is a really so minuscule compared to all the other risks I'm facing that I just I don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> maybe I should. So someday when you're reading the paper that Randy Newberg was mauled by a mountain lion, you'd say, I don't see Randy, you should have been paying better attention. Uh, so, uh, Mark asks, hey Randy, do you hike with your rifle loaded? I'm not sure if he says rifle when you're asking Mark rifle loaded, if you mean some in the chamber or one in the chamber or just loaded being in the magazine. I never hike with anything in the chamber, never. There's no animal in this world that's worth an accident. And I've talked to a lot of super experienced hunters who have said, 
I can't believe it happened. I, I had no idea that I fell and da da da. There was a really good uh, Facebook piece about some guys here in Montana. Guy shot a bull, I think, if I remember right, and they were moving to go look. I think there might have been a second bull. Two buddies, lifelong buddies, experienced hunters, and one guy slipped, and he didn't even know what had happened, but his rifle went off because there was a round in the chamber, and I think it killed his buddy. It's so tragic. I watched his his story on Facebook. I'm like, oh my gosh. Uh, if you hunt with us, we have guest hunters, you're not allowed to carry one in the chamber. And if someone violates that, we've had people, I'll get back to the truck and I'll see them jacking one out of the chamber. I'm like, what's the deal? Oh, well, you know, if we saw one, I wanted to be ready. No, no. Especially rifle elk hunting. I have never been in a situation where the m minute time it takes to go ch -ch -ch and chamber around is what would have caused that elk to get away. I, I'm usually inspecting them more. It's like, all right, is it a bull? Is it a cow? Is it a mature bull that is legal here? Or what if it's a spike? If it's a spike, does it have a small brow tine? So I, I'm usually, in most places you hunt, you have to spend enough time analyzing that elk to see if it's legal anyhow. And in that time, I can be looking at that elk and I can be putting one in the chamber and getting ready. Yeah, when we get ready to shoot, obviously we've got one in the chamber, but uh, I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, I just, I am absolutely particular about nothing in the chamber. And if somebody feels otherwise, I get that, but there's there just way too many instances where uh, tragedy is struck. And there's, like I said, there's nothing. There, there's no animal in this world that's worth a tragedy out there. So, uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> we were talking about this today. Zach says, Randy, I just saw Montana passed a new law that allows people to keep bighorn sheep deadheads and skulls that they found. Does that mean that you get those two brutes back that you came across? And uh, we were doing a sheep hunt up in the Missouri Breaks. We found two rams that were over 199 inches. At that time, you had to call a game and fish or fish, wildlife and parks. and they came in and got them. So maybe I should call them and say, hey, uh, when, when, <laughs> when, when do I get my sheep skulls, right? Uh, I think that's what Zach is referring to. And Marcus, one of the camera guys asked me that today. I'm like, I don't think they're gonna give them to me. <laughs> uh, let's see. John asks, my new job doesn't allow me to get out west before the end of November. Are there any other elk hunts, rifle, muzzleloader, etc.? Just looking for meat, not so much antler. Thank you. Uh, there are some that are in December. Uh, some of the Wyoming cow hunts go into December. Montana has some cow hunts that go into December. Uh, the Idaho, uh, they have some bull elk hunts that go into December, but they're limited entry draw. So you'd have to buy your non-resident license and apply in that limited entry controlled hunt in uh, Idaho before the June 5th deadline. So hopefully that those are some ideas to think about. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Wow, someone says they saw four separate mountain lions in the same meadow hunting last year. Holy smokes. Uh, Someone says I was charged by a mountain lion three times. Wow, I've never had that. I'm, I must be living a clean life or something. Let's see. Villamore asks, or Joshua, I'm not sure which it is, the first name or last name. Randy, what pound draw weight would be ideal draw weight for elk? I wanna make sure my draw is strong enough. Um, part of that depends on what your draw length is because the longer your draw length, the more velocity, the speed you're gonna get from the same draw weight. So a person with a 24 inch draw length 
is going to struggle to get the same amount of speed and energy and penetration as someone with a 29 or 30 inch draw length. So uh, for me at my 29 inch draw length, I think 60 is more than adequate in a high quality bow like this round that I have here. Uh, I know people who hunt with 50 pounds. Uh, just know that w whatever you do, the lower you go, and there are state minimums, so obviously make sure you meet your state minimum requirements for elk. But you're going to have to be more precise in your arrow placement and more careful with your shot angle selection. So um, I know that that might not be a, a precise answer, but you got to think about all of those factors. Uh, Robert says, first time out of state hunt since I can't draw here in Arizona. Would you do over the counter, counter elk in Colorado or Idaho? Uh, for archery. I would do, if I was doing archery, I'd do Idaho. Um, Idaho doesn't have the complication of the muzzleloader hunters being there for eight or ten days while you're archery hunting. So Idaho's got some really good over-the-counter elk hunting. Uh, go out to their state or go to Go Hunt and look at the units that have the best populations. And by populations, I mean the trend line, right? If you, you can't just look at one year to say how the population's doing. You gotta look at the trend lines. Uh, and go to one of those units that look like they're you know, stable or possibly increasing, because there are some units in, in Idaho that are decreasing. Um, but all that information's out on Go Hunt or it's out there on uh, Idaho Game and Fish website. Uh, let's see. Do I use a decoy? Uh, I don't. Uh, I do for antelope, but not for elk or deer. Um, we got that question. We were, Corey Jacobson and I would do the elk talk podcast and we did a live podcast down in uh, Boise last weekend. And someone asked that same question. Um, and uh, it's not, I, I just don't use uh, decoys. Oh, speaking of which, live podcasts. Corey and I at the elk camp and so, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation is having their elk camp in Park City, Utah this year, July 11th through the 14th. And Corey and I, on that Friday and that Saturday, we're doing a live Q&A podcast. It's just kind of like Elk Talk Live here, but we're recording it for a podcast and we're filling the room with people. And when we do it, like in Boise, I, I don't know what the prizes will be, but anyone who got up and asked a question in Boise got a free call from Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls and got a free knife from Gerber. So, uh, one, go to elk camp, too, if you do, show up and uh, hang out with uh, me and hang out with Corey while we're doing that. It'd be a lot of fun. Um, let's see. <laughs> Units. Anytime someone asks a unit question, I don't answer them. I'm sorry, folks, uh, because I'm... People already have the ability to figure out a bit of where we're hunting, and I don't want to. Uh, I, I don't want to put any more pressure on places we hunt. For whatever reason, people think watching our YouTube channel is scouting uh, and research. So I, there's a couple unit questions in here, and I don't want to disregard them, but we just don't answer them or give out units. Uh, Kip asks, Randy, do you consider the Gravelly Range of Southwest Montana to be grizzly bear country? Yes, especially the south end of the Gravelys. Um, definitely plenty of grizzly bears there. Um, quite a few elk, too. Uh, to, if you look at Montana, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks makes a map by unit. If it's red, it's over objective. If it's green, it's at objective. And if it's white, it's under objective, if I remember right. That whole gravelly complex is red. In other words, they're over objective there. So um, probably over objective on grizzly bears too on the south half. Um, <laughs> I know uh, some people are going to be like, well, why would I go hunt there? Um, <laughs> oh, you guys have some really funny questions here. These Instagram questions. I'm, what is it about the Instagram questions that are always way more humorous and entertaining than the other ones? Uh, <laughs> 
What calls do I recommend for a late season or a, a late October elk hunt? Um, the only thing I do is I'd probably have a diaphragm call. I've never had any luck bugling or calling elk in that time of year. Uh, the reason I would have a diaphragm call is if you're going in on a stock and that bull gets up and you need to stop him just for that few seconds to get set up and get a shot or get a look at him to say, okay, he's legal. A diaphragm call in your mouth, it's hands-free, just a quick cow call, really gives you the chance, uh, better than anything, of stopping them. But as far as actually calling uh, that time of year, I, I don't do it. Um, maybe I should, but I don't. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, someone asked, Randy, I love watching all your new stuff, all your stuff on Amazon. When's a new season coming to Amazon? Uh, I told the crew we have to have season seven ready to go on Amazon by June 15th, which means if we submit it to Amazon by June 15th, the Amazon has a long approval process. Hopefully it'll be ready in early July. Um, let's hope. But if you watched, we did. We released a new thing. Uh, if you go to our Amazon landing page, there's Fresh Tracks with Randy Newberg, and then there's Fresh Tracks Films. And we have 2017 films and 2018 films. We just released a new film from our 2018 hunts called Reindeer. That was released this weekend. It premiered down in Boise. Uh, so hopefully you'll go out to our Amazon channel and, and look at that. Uh, what was this about GPS coordinates? <laughs> Jeff says, yeah, definitely don't give out units, but what would be a good GPS location for my first Wyoming elk hunt? People, <laughs> I've had people email our sponsors complaining that I wouldn't give them GPS coordinates or tell them what drainage. And I'm like, I I'm not going to do that. I mean, I already get enough heat when I say central Wyoming or eastern Nevada or southwest, southeastern Montana. If I use those general terms, I already get a lot of heat. So nobody's getting units, GPS coordinates, or anything out of me. Uh, let's see. Oh, someone said, yeah, reindeer was really good. And understand it's rain, like rain that falls to the ground because it's a Sitka blacktail hunt up where it rains all the time. So, uh, let's see. Randy, have you heard of any recently closed areas due to fire around the San Juan Mountains in Colorado? I've not heard of any uh, that have been closed. I mean, we're way far away from a season. Um, the season's open there the last, the first archery season opens the last weekend in August, so it'll be a long time. Uh, a lot of time passes before uh, they would make a decision of, of what to do there. Uh, <laughs> Tony asks, Randy, what's a good grouse to elk hunting ratio? Asking for a friend. Uh, I don't know, but the more grouse, the better. <clears throat> Do you use solar chargers at hunting camp? And if you do, what kind? Um, we do sometimes at base camps, but we've gotten away from those. Um, I don't have one with me. We've been using these jackeries, these like blocks, these charging blocks. What do you got over there that you're looking at, Kyler? Oh, uh, those are old ones, but we, we don't use them that much anymore. They're too bulky, too cumbersome. At base camps, we're usually, we usually have a trailer where we can bring a generator or something. So in the back country, we've switched over to using these charging blocks. They can charge our phones, charge our GPSs. If we're bringing those, we pretty much we're running them on what you see there, our smartphone. Uh, they'll charge our small camera batteries. They'll charge our uh, inReach. They'll charge a lot of things and they're just easier and handier. Um, so. We haven't been using much in the way of, of uh, <laughs> we haven't been using much in the way of panels. Uh, <laughs> gosh. <laughs> uh, what else we got on Instagram, Kyler? Um, Randy, do you, th oh. <laughs> I was about ready to read that question. Uh, no, I don't feed the camera guys to the bears. 
Um, grizzly bear hunting or country. I, a couple of questions on that. So in southern Montana, you're dealing with grizzly bears. Western Wyoming, you're dealing with grizzly bears. Eastern Idaho, you're dealing with grizzly bears. And Northwest Montana, you're dealing with grizzly bears. Those areas have some really, really good elk hunting. And if you go out and you do research, uh, the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee, most of the state agencies, uh, the Forest Service that, ha that manages lands that are in grizzly country, they have really, really good information out there about how to avoid bears to start with, keep a clean camp, food storage, uh, storage of any animal you might take, uh, all, all that kind of stuff. Places where bears are likely to be at certain seasons of the year or certain times of the day. Avoidance of a bear conflict is the easiest and, and the safest way to hunt grizzly country. Yeah, there's just the bad luck time where you did everything right and ran into one. Um, but it's, it's definitely different hunting in grizzly country. I'm not going to deny that. It also is kind of cool hunting in grizzly country. And it's where in Montana and, well, I hunt a lot in grizzly country and I, I find that there's really good elk numbers in grizzly country. The age class is really good and the hunting pressure is really low. So um, it's just something that you gotta figure out how to get comfortable with. And once you do, you're gonna have better elk hunting and fewer people in the woods with you. So. Uh, how do you overcome the eye strain after long hours of glassing? That's a good question. Uh, now that I'm older and my eyes aren't what they were, I just have to pull back every five minutes and just kind of look at something further, like far away, and then look at something a little closer just to make sure that I'm adjusting and working my eyes to not just be always right here. Um, and it, for me, it doesn't matter if I'm on a binos, if I'm on a spotter or whatever. I've noticed as I've gotten older, it just, it's a reality I got to do with, deal with. So that's why a lot of times it's fun to glass with another person there because you're each, it, one of you are probably always on the glass and, uh, you're, it's just part of the glassing gig. Um, got to accept it. How do I like Leopold's new spotter right here at the Santium? Uh, love it. Uh, this is the model, at an angled eyepiece, and then they make the straight eyepiece. We have both. Um, really, really like it. Um, <laughs> uh, someone has this normal answer. In grizzly country, just make sure whoever is with you is slower than Randy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm the oldest guy in the crew, so the odds are I'm going to be the slowest guy also. Um, do I ever hunt on the East Coast? Christy asked. No, I don't. Um, and we we get asked this a lot. Our sponsors, our partners who help make all this possible, they come to us to cover big game hunting in the Rockies for the most part. And, yeah, if we you know do one hunt a year that's maybe – a whitetail hunt or maybe something else. They're good with that. But they've already got money that they're investing in other platforms that do hogs or do wild turkeys or do whitetails or whatever. So they don't want us out there duplicating where they're already making their investment. So that's a big part of what drives where we hunt. And it's, it's really hard ah, trying to think what would bring me to the East Coast. Probably nothing. Uh, but a Kentucky elk tag would get me east of the Mississippi, hint, hint, uh, or Pennsylvania. Uh, very unlikely, but um, Kirk asked, do I carry a bigger rifle in grizzly country? No, I don't. Actually, I carry bear spray. Um, if I were to have a bear encounter, I would be reaching for my bear spray first and foremost. Um, and I've had two encounters where I was archery hunting and you're, you're going in on an elk or you're just slowly going through the woods. One of them, I was going in on an elk and your mind is on the hunt. And all of a sudden here's this chocolate brown thing pops up in the brush just right there. 
And fortunately for me, both of those were single bears. I think they were boars. They whirled and they just took off away from me. Now, seeing how fast they covered ground when they took off away from me, if that would have been a sow with cubs or it would have been a boar defending a carcass, that bear would have been on me before I could have even thought about getting my rifle ready. So I probably would have had the situation where I've got a bear on top of me and I'm, prob I'm probably gonna get knocked down. I'm probably not gonna be able to employ my rifle. But if I've got something right here while I'm protecting myself that I can be spraying, that's probably a more effective deterrent. Uh, I don't know. Some, someone is going to say you're nuts, Randy, and, and I get that. Uh, use whatever you're comfortable with is, is uh, my point, and be smart in grizzly country. Um, so someone says, uh, someone provided some input on Idaho tags since Idaho is mostly an over-the-counter state. He said if you're looking for the sawtooth zone elk tags, those sell out in about 15 minutes after they go on sale because there's a cap on them. Uh, that's, yeah, good. Thanks for bringing that up, Ken. Some of the units are sold out in, or zones and they sell out really, really quick because they're high demand. Uh, and when it's first come, first serve, you better have your application or be online or on the phone getting it El Pronto. Um, Nick asks, would you go back to an area, quote, in Colorado, if you only saw a group of three to 15 elk on a three day hunt? Not sure how many elk I should be seeing on average. Um, if I saw a lot of sign, I would. I mean, <laughs> we've done five day hunts where we haven't seen 15 elk. Um, I, I wouldn't give up just because you only saw 10 to 15 elk. Um, if it, if it has all the other attributes that could make it a good unit. Does it have good harvest statistics? Does it have a, a growing or stable population where the cow to calf ratio is, is stable? Does it have a good bull to cow ratio? Stuff like that. Is it the kind of country you like to hunt? Do, do, and, because if, if you're in country you like to hunt, you're gonna hunt harder. So I love to glass. So I like places that are a little bit broken and open. I know some people who love to still hunt. They're just sneaking through the timber. And they love these great big expanses of dark timber, even though they know the elk densities are lower in those areas. They love to get on a track and they just follow it in the snow. Whatever works for your style of hunting is also a part of what, what should go into that. <clears throat> We've, let's see, <laughs> Tony asks, when are you going to hunt the Boundary Waters and do a hunt with Orion Coolers and Jackson's kayaks? I get asked that a lot by my family back in Minnesota. Um, odds are I'm probably not gonna make it back there for a hunt. I'll be back there fishing at times, but probably not for a hunt. Uh, so it sounds like Todd might be going to the elk camp. That'd be great if we could see you there. Um, <laughs> uh, Jeremy asks, Randy, what brand of shotgun and ammo do you recommend for upland game hunting? What do we got over there, Kyler? We got a pointer shotgun. We got, what do we got, six pointer shotguns over there? Right here, this, this is an over and under. I'm more of a just big long tom guy, uh, but I, this is a 12 gauge. Um, a lot of times I have a pointer 20 gauge just tucked in behind the, on the back seat. I have a scabbard in my truck, but I use pointer shotguns. Um, again, it's value, right? Performance and price where that intersects is value, super value with pointer shotguns. Um, and so that's what I use. Uh, Randy, when elk hunting in archery season, do you ever do cold call setups? Oh yeah, lots of times. Um, they're more locating setups than they are cold calls. Um, let's see. Um, Randy, why Orion coolers or any of the other overpriced coolers? Because when you live out of coolers like I do for 100 days a year, you want the best coolers. <laughs> you want to keep your game if you're lucky. You want to keep it cold. You want to get it home without it spoiling. You don't want melted ice with a cooler that's nothing but a pile of water. 
uh, when you're on a hunt for a week in Nevada, you want a cooler that keeps everything cold so that your lunch meats or your whatever it is you're going to be cooking and other stuff. So uh, a lot of people ask, Randy, how is it that you use this product or that product that's expensive? Everything I use, I've arrived at for a reason. And I use equipment intensively uh, over 100 days a year. So I, I'm not going to skimp on boots. I have to have clothing that regardless of the camel pattern, it has to perform in a whole variety of conditions. I need, you know, you could go through the whole list of stuff we use, backpacks, the whole works. Uh, and I get that all of it's an investment. Well, what's the old saying? Buy once, cry once. Uh, yeah, you, maybe you say, oh boy, that was quite an investment, but it's going to last you forever. There's nothing that I use that I don't feel that is going to fail or won't last you most of your hunting life. So, uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but it was asked. So, uh, let's see, Randy, there are two very popular calibers right now, 6.5 Creedmoor and a 300 Blackout. Which would you, or how do you, comfortable are you with those for elk? Um, I don't know, they'll both kill an elk, but neither of them would be my first choice. So whenever you get into cartridges, you're, you're setting yourself up for an argument. Um, uh, I was just out yesterday, Kyler, we were banging away at what, 450 yards, 440 yards with my 6.5 Creedmoor, with my 308 and my 300 Win Mag. All of them were just, boom, just march them out there and doing, 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 doing. So. Would I use a 6.5 Creedmoor when I might have a 400 yard shot at an elk or would I use my 300 Win Mag? Probably my 300 Win Mag. If I know I'm probably going to have shots under 400 yards, I'm probably going with my 308 because it's a short action. It's easier, it just, because it's got a shorter barrel, uh, it's lighter, it's all those things, I'm probably going with my 308. And uh, like I said, all of those have uh, a, a the ability to kill an elk, a 6.5 to whatever. It's just some are better suited in my mind. Um, again, <laughs> there's so much opinion related there. Oh yeah, someone just said, oh, remind us, or remind people that when you do buy an Orion cooler, use promo code Randy and save 20%. Yeah, orioncoolers.com save you 20% by using promo code Randy. Um, don't try to use promo code Randy at Dairy Queen though. Doesn't work there. Some people have told me they, they've tried it. Um, if you want to get text notifications, now that we're getting back to a regular schedule, uh, next week we're bear hunting all week in the evening, so we're not going to be on next week, but we are the following week. But if you want to get notified, text Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 64600. Uh, hopefully you'll catch all of our stuff on our YouTube channel, Randy Newberg Hunter, or our Amazon channel. Uh, Fresh Tracks with Randy Newberg. And we're on Facebook, Instagram. We have a big forum called hunttalk.com. Uh, it's all self-guided Western hunting out there, public land hunting. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of good questions. This is a good, good week. We got any more Instagram questions, Kyler? Let's see. Someone says, hey, Randy. Hey, <laughs> I think they, they meant to ask their question. They must have hit the enter button. <clears throat> um, let's see. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to answer that question. Uh, I thought about it, but then I decided not to. Um, David has a good point. Trends are departures from conventional wisdom, nearly always. That's a very good point. Uh, there's a herd mentality in almost all parts of hunting. And I don't care if it's the application for tags, if it's the way, the, the, the hot place you should go. Uh, David, this, I'm glad you brought this up. I, I'm kind of a contrarian, okay? So there's all these research services and some magazines that tell you, oh, apply here, apply there, do this, do that. Um, 
I, I don't apply in any of the popular places. Maybe in, I mean, in some places there's so few non-resident tags, you just don't have a choice, but you gotta compete with tons of people. Uh, I, I apply in that mid-tier, lower tier of units where access is probably harder, uh, the success rates might be a little lower, maybe there's not big chunks of public land, maybe it's not the best season dates, but that's how we get so many tags. And so the trend is, oh, I want to get a Gila tag in New Mexico. Oh, I want to get a whatever tag in Arizona or me. I'm, no, I'm not doing any of that stuff. So uh, I think David's point that about trends is, is very, very interesting. And some of the places I hunt, it, or uh, so once I have my tag, the type of locations I hunt, I don't run into that many people because I'm usually not following the pack. Um, so we should almost do a whole podcast on trends and contrarianism. Thanks for bringing that up, David. That's that's a good point that we should uh, we should discuss more often. I I just take advantage of or take for granted and assume everybody has been doing this for years and years and uh, maybe I should talk about some of the things I do but if I talked about them then maybe they'd become trends and then I wouldn't be a contrarian anymore so I'd have to think about that one. Uh, Joshua asks, can you explain which slope be it north or south elk prefer to bed or to feed? Um, you're gonna get a million different replies to this. Uh, very seldom do I see elk on straight south-facing slopes. Uh, they will sometimes if the vegetation or the forage has not burned off like it often does in August, right? If you look in August, the first hills to go brown are the ones facing south. So the elk are feeding more in, in those periods when our hunting seasons are there, more on the southwest. So, uh, southeast. I hope I'm doing this right for you guys. I'm, I'm trying to make it <laughs> on camera look the right way. Or the northwest, which to me feels like southeast here, uh, or the northeast. Now, there's very seldom any food on a north-facing slope. Very seldom, because it's all dark timber. They use that for security cover and for bedding cover. But they're not going to do that unless there is food somewhere nearby. So, Think about that. If you see that elk are using a north-facing slope for bedding, the odds are they're going somewhere every mo every evening or every afternoon and coming back every morning from a food source. Um, a couple other things. If you read, if you haven't bought the book Elk and Elk Ecology by Jack Ward Thomas, you can get it from the uh, what is it, the Wildlife Management Institute. Go and read this stuff about preferred bedding areas. Right. It's, it's gold, absolute gold. Those studies, I wish I had something here that would replicate. So let's say this is a mountain slope. This is the valley, this is the peak. Those studies show that elk like to bed in the top third of the mountain range or of the ridge or whatever it is. So when I'm glassing, I know that if I only have so much time before dark, I'm focusing on that top third. I'm gonna put less of my effort into the bottom third. I also know, based on that research, that an elk likes to bed on a slope that is less than 20 degrees. So, the really steep stuff, there better be a little bench there for him to bed on that's flattened out, because those really steep faces, he's not bedding there. He's gonna go drop down, or he's gonna find a little corner or something where it flattens out a little bit. So, just by knowing those little pieces, you can be way more focused and way more effective in the time you spend behind the glass. Um, and part of that gets into this north slope, south slope, bedding, feeding. Um, I don't think it's, it's easy to say one or the other. Depends on the vegetation patterns, depends on the, if there's a trail coming up the east slope. Well, guess what? The, the west, southwest, northwest is probably gonna be more preferred than the east sides. So there, there's all kinds of things that go into that explanation or, or at least how I approach it. Um, there's, there's no certain answer other than south slopes as a general rule by hunting season is almost gonna be too burned off. Yeah, later in December, 
They're going to be out in January. They're going to be out on those slopes because that's the warmest places. And the snow is going to be blown off and melted off those places quicker. So it's easier for them to forage all the dried out stuff that's there. And yeah, they are going to use north faces some, but it's mostly for bedding purposes. Um, uh, when hunting pressured elk, what are the odds a bull will take the same route out to feed in the evening that he took to bed that morning? If he's not been pressured, it's a very, very good. So we'll be on this knob. We'll find an elk over here that evening or that morning, whatever. And we can't get over there before they go to their bed. Just, I'm not giving up on that spot because unless that bull gets pressured, say I saw him in the morning, he's coming out that evening very nearby, very close. And I'm gonna be in some place closer where I'm gonna be in shooting range. Or if I see him come out in the evening and it's a post rut or a late season period, he's gonna come out and he's gonna feed there. I'm gonna walk in in the dark and the next morning I'm gonna be set up so when it gets daylight and he's still doing his thing out there or whatever trail he's going to take that probably brings him back to the bedding area, I'm going to be there. And I don't know how many elk we've killed that way in rifle seasons. We see them, we put them to bed, and we just let them do their thing. We hope nobody bumps them, and then we get set up. So when they come back out, they're, they may not use the same exact trail, but very often they're only coming a few hundred yards from their bedding area to their feeding area because when they're in sanctuary mode, <clears throat> They're not out in big meadows and parks. They're coming out into little areas, little openings. And I just gotta be set up near there. And boom, hopefully it happens. <clears throat> um, uh, let's see. Uh, when do elk start to use wallows? Um, I don't know, I've seen them using wallows in late August actually, so. Um, Dennis asks, Randy, do you know anything about the Unit 410 area in Montana? Yep, I do. I've hunted a lot. Uh, one thing, I don't know where you're from, Dennis, uh, if you're out of state. A lot of people apply for the Missouri Breaks in Montana and they think it's going to be this wilderness hunt. It is not. The Missouri Breaks in Montana is as close to combat hunting as you're going to find. And I took a question at this uh, about this in Boise at uh, the last weekend when Corey and I did the Q&A session. <clears throat> and I hated to burst the person's bubble, but they came up to me afterwards uh, and said, man, I appreciate you giving me some general ideas. How crowded is it? I'm like, crowded. It just, it is. So that unit, 410, uh, the north side of the river, all that 417, it's crowded in the public area. So. Um, yeah, I know a lot about it. And you have to figure out how to use that hunting pressure to your advantage. So, uh, have you ever found that elk, that elk seem to stay in a sweet spot between the hunters who go way back in and those who don't go far off the roads? Yeah. Uh, Marcus Hawkins, my Hockett, my camera guy calls it the reverse Randy Newberg effect. Uh, yeah. There, there, there are people who hike past a lot of elk just to say, oh, I was in there six miles. Hey, if that's what turns you crank and you want to go in there six miles, I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, but don't walk past elk just to say, I'm out, I'm back there six miles. Um, what was that? Kevin asked, Randy, when you're doing your e-scouting, what does a bench look like on a topo map? We did a video on that out on our YouTube channel. Uh, it, it'll show you, but so topo lines stacked really steep, mean they're really close together, means that it's a steep slope. Once you start seeing a gap, it almost looks like a little U shape where a little bench might run out from that. You'll see the topo lines get further apart. So, but go watch that YouTube video on our YouTube channel. It goes into benches, valleys, draws, coolies. Uh, because we use all this language uh, and we try to, we, we take it for granted and people are like, what do you mean by that? Um, so, uh, Randy, do you think that elk go nocturnal after hunting pressure? I don't know that they go per se nocturnal in the rut. In the rut, they go with whatever the cow does. I do think that 
after the rut's over, the post rut and the late season, yeah, they're pretty much not fully nocturnal, but if it's super warm or it's warm in a full moon, you're gonna get little glimpses of them the first 10 minutes of shooting light and the last 10 minutes of shooting light. The cooler it gets, the less pressure they have, then they're gonna be oh, out there more during those days, you know, for maybe an hour after shooting light or an hour before the end of shooting light. But yeah, in, in those periods, after all that pressure has been there, they're, they're definitely, I, I don't know if nocturnal is the right word in, in the sense of they only do things in the dark, but they shift to most of their patterns being uh, up on their feet in the dark and on the, in a bed and thick stuff in a canyon and a rock pile and the timber, whatever, during the daylight. Um, Randy, have you ever sent your Kenetrek Mountain Extreme boots in to get resold? Yep, I have. Uh, they do it, do a great job. Uh, how often do I call when I'm walking? Mm, in rifle season, never. Uh, in archery season, very seldom, unless I think I heard a bull or saw or heard something. Maybe I'll make a small call call, but I usually don't do much calling when I'm walking. Thoughts on the 25 out six? Uh, the 25 is a great uh, caliber. Um, 25 out six has killed a lot of elk and will kill an elk. Uh, but again, you're using, a, in most instances, you're using a smaller grain bullet. So you just need to be really careful with your shot placement, your shot distances and the shot angles. So, oh, you got anything that's uh, just, we got to talk about Kyler? Eh, I'm, I'm searching here. There's got to be a few really good ones at the end. But before we wrap it up, we want to thank the folks at Bowtech for making this possible. Leupold, Onyx, Go Hunt, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls, Tight Spot, Black Gold, and Ripcord. Um, and use promo code Randy at Onyx, Go Hunt, and Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls and save a bunch of money. Uh, let's see. There's got to be something else here. I'm looking for, I, I usually try to save one really good one for the end. Uh, <laughs> Richard says, hey Randy, I'm in Cancun, Mexico, and I made friends with some folks from Montana. I told them I have to hurry and get back to the room so I can watch you. They said they understood. <laughs> oh man. I'm not sure if they should understand. Uh, advice you get from me is probably worth what you paid for it. I've made more mistakes hunting. It, the, the only thing I have to build from is how many bad, stupid things I've done, bad mistakes I've made while out hunting. So, uh, um, let's see. I'm looking for one last good one. He, oh, Kyler says he's got one for me here. <laughs> uh, this is a good one. My four-year-old is watching with me and keeps asking what your favorite arrow is. Hers is pink. <laughs> I don't have any pink arrows. Uh, my favorite arrow are my full metal jackets. Uh, I started using those last year. I'm very impressed. Um, and my fletching colors are red and white. Maybe I should do red, white, and blue. But my eye just sees red or white way better when it's going through through there. And, and now that Montana lighted knocks are legal, maybe I should switch over to that. I've tried a few of them and they really show you where your arrow's going. But So you can tell your daughter that Randy uses full metal jacket arrows that are more of a silver and black, not pink. So anyhow, folks, thanks for watching. We've kept you a long time tonight. Uh, we won't be here next week, but we will be here in two weeks. And uh, remember, you've got Oregon's deadline May 15th, and you got the deadline for Idaho June 5th. And if you don't draw anything, come June, we're going to start talking about the over-the-counter options, the leftover tag options, and the first-come, first-serve options. So thanks for watching. Have a good evening.